All right, so everyone back. Everyone back from pizza. Okay, um, I'm going to keep this quite short because that was nice and long, and I hope the panel's going to be nice and long and involved as well. So I'm Jamie. I work for With Associates. We're a digital agency. Um, we build stuff on the web platform. Some of it's with Rails, and increasingly a lot of it's with Ember. Um, last month, Shimon um, demonstrated his new project called Ancient Oak. And it's an immutable data trees library written in JavaScript. He's kind of come from the closure, closure script background and brought some of those ideas into a, a sort of micro library. And uh, he, he gave this really sort of thorough explanation of how it works under the hood, um, why, it, why and how it's efficient, you know, and some of, the, some of the abstract reasons you might want to use it, but not a real kind of application demo. And, um, I was really captivated with the library, but I think a lot of us in the pub afterwards were kind of like trying to think of like what I'd use this for. Why would I use persistent data structures in an Ember app or something like that? So um, for anyone who wasn't here or doesn't know what they are, I've got a probably fairly inaccurate little walkthrough of what I think they mean to an Ember app. So um, let's say you've got an Ember app. And this is the data structure that your UI is manipulating. And it's, you've got a user object, which has got some fields on it, and a basket, which has got some items and some other bits and bobs in that. And you mutate the email. And that implies that the user object has also been mutated. And then let's say you mutate the color here. That implies that this item has been mutated, as is the basket, all the way on up to the user. And Ember makes sure that all those mutations notify every part of the UI or other parts of the app that you might be interested in. And then you bind up other bits of the UI. And it's brilliant until you reach a moment where actually you don't want to just hand over a piece of this data to some part of the UI that might go ahead and, and change it willy-nilly. Like, I think the example of this is, I think this is my next slide. So you've got an edit route. So let's say uh, you have an edit route for your user. You transition into it. And there's a, an input text field that's bound to someone's name. And it's kind of magic when you use Ember for the first time or Angular. Uh, you start editing the name. And immediately, every way that it's used also updates. But I think if you're editing your profile, that, that isn't the expected behavior. So one answer to this is you, you kind of make a a clone of the user, give it to the edit route so that you can kind of edit in isolation in this little buffer, make your changes, and then either uh, apply them back to the kind of canonical user model that's in memory, or discard them if you want to cancel it. And that, that totally works, but you've got to remember to copy the model. Like you'll hit a bug where things are changing you didn't expect, and it's because you forgot to copy it, and then you might add something to your template that clobbers the basket. Like maybe, maybe it sets a basket property on this copy of the user. You reapply that to the canonical user, and then your whole basket tree has gone away, and you've, you've lost it. It's just got garbage collected or something like that. And that's maybe if you forgot to add the, uh, the true flag to say this is a deep clone of this object. So this is where, oh man, that color's good on this uh, projector. So now it's green. This means this is immutable, which means none of this can be changed. All you can do is produce new versions of this tree. And this is what uh, Ancient Oak, Shimon's library, does. And what things like, uh, I think it's Mori, which is David Nolan's port of the ClojureScript library. So this thing is effectively frozen. And it really is frozen. Shimon's is unique in that it will do a, a deep, immutable tree. You feed it this tree. From then on in, all you can do is make new versions of it. And then you can hand that thing to edit root. And when edit root sets stuff, or this is the idea, you're not changing that original tree, which is tied to other bits of your application. You're creating a new version of it. But because it's a persistent data structure, and this is kind of where the, the, the memory optimization, the efficiency comes in, those fields that haven't changed still point to the old places in memory. They're shared with the original version of this tree. The only thing that's new is this new thing that you've changed, the thing that you've set in your, your brand new version. And if you did want, you know, if you hit save then on your edit route, you would 
promote your new version of the user model, let's say, up to be the, the new canonical version. And it still uses all the old tree. So there are implications there for it being quicker and uh, allocating less memory and therefore less garbage collection. And with this example, it's so trivial that you know, it doesn't completely make the case, but imagine your tree was much more complex. And the idea of doing a deep clone of your tree, if you just wanted to give it to another part of your app, gave you the sweats a little bit. Even better, rather than simply kind of promoting this new version, you could keep a stack of all the versions. And they're not a complete, like, brand new tree each time. They just point to the bits that are just for them and all the bits that are shared between all the trees. And then flicking between versions is just a matter of picking the one you want and then following it down, and you'll get all the stuff. Like, that stuff is guaranteed to be shared. And it's, you flick over to the other one, and it, you'll see the new tree. So I wanted to see whether this could be made to work with Ember without giving up on data bindings, without giving up on all the nice stuff, basically. Um, this experiment isn't finished yet, so I'm just going to do a quick walkthrough of where I've got to so far and hopefully like, plant the seed of, why, of, like, of where you could go with this and that they're not incompatible ideas. So, uh, I think I may be best served by turning mirroring off. That's, that's a, uh, a bit of recursive video recording <laughs> capture, by the way. <laughs> OK. So I'm just going to, I think I'm on the new version now. Let's turn on that. Uh, so this is without. So this app looks like, uh, let's see the router first. So it's got a, a user edit route and a basket route. And you can see those in action like that. And so let's have a look at what the edit route looks like, because that's kind of what we're interested in for this purpose. So this is how I've chosen to implement this, and it's I'm not saying this is the best way to do this, and there are, I think there's a nice concept of um, like a buffered form that you can look into if you're interested in that. But um, the way I'm isolating this edit view from changing the canonical user record is just to pluck off, this is my clone, this get properties. I want to pluck off the name and email from that user object and present it as a new model for my route to work with. If I didn't do that, if I just gave it the user directly, so actually I'll, I'll do that. Um, so if you don't isolate your model, you end up sort of updating bits of the UI that you maybe didn't intend to. And again, like this is this is like the surface example of of this problem. Like that isn't a problem, but there might be if you extrapolate it out and imagine bits of your UI changing stuff that you didn't intend them to, then there will come a point where you'll get bitten. So um, as I say, the way to, a way to isolate that is now this route is working on an entirely new clone of the data. And um, when I save it, it's just going to get that user model, get the, the model I'm currently working with, and then just punch down the properties I've set on this new one onto my old one, and that saves, and then it does update. But something, but other weird stuff could happen here. So this new model that I've created, you know, you could, like I say, set a basket property on that, and you'd end up setting it on the user and clobbering your own basket. But and again, so with this, uh, with this example, to like throw, to discard your changes, all you need to do is forget about them. This model up here, you can just let it get garbage collected. You don't need it anymore. So this was kind of the, the toy app I started working with to try and work ancient oak into the mix. And um, 
Let's see. This is kind of similar at the moment. Um, I haven't quite got so ideally what I wanted to be able to do was just return this dot get user and trust that that is safe and any updates that this would make I'm guaranteed to get a new version of the user just inside of this route and then I can choose to like mutate that canonical user you know sort of promote that version up to being the the main version but I haven't quite got there yet but um, what you can see down here is a, a versions flag so now if I go edit Joe Smith and uh, and now I've got a second version. And I can roll back between my versions. And so what, what I wanted was for all these new versions that have been created of the user, mo the, uh, I say model, but the user tree to work in that way that my sort of uh, boxes and sticks diagram demonstrated where you can just pop to a different one and it's all it's kind of all still pointing to the same original data plus the new stuff that you've added on as the apps progressed so what I ended up with uh, the user object that's injected into this app looks a bit like this it's um, it's a new ancient oak that's not the uh, API for Ancient Oak. Ancient Oak is just uh, capital I, and then you feed it some data, and then you work with what it returns, and it's all kind of encapsulated in a closure. I've made it sort of object oriented -y, and it's meant to behave like an Ember object, so I feed it my starting data structure, my version one. And then I've tried broadly to implement the stuff you'd expect on Ember objects on this. So. Um, <coughs> Let me just make that a bit bigger. So it's just an object that uh, mixes in array and enumerable. And you see it's got this, um, this versions property, which gets set right here. You can see this is uh, Ancient Oaks API. So when you initialize this thing, it's going to either feed what, feed what you give it or just a, an empty object to Ancient Oak, which is going to produce this immutable data tree. And I'm just going to store that as my first version in my array. And then Ember, a bit like Ruby, has, mything, uh, has a method missing. Ember has unknown property and set unknown, set unknown property. So I'm using that when you call get on an object in Ember and you haven't explicitly defined the property or a, uh, a computer property, this will get a chance to do something. So what I'm saying is I'm going to look in current, which is just an alias for the, the top of the stack of versions. And again, this is uh, Ancient Oaks API. When you want to get something from it, you it's, it's a function. So you just call it with the key. And it will give you back, if it's a, a primitive, it will give you a string or a number, whatever that primitive is. If it's another tree, it will give you another Ancient Oak object back. So what you see here is Oak or primitive with whatever, whatever comes out of the tree for this. And Oak or Primitive says, if it's, if it's another ancient oak object, wrap it in another one of my kind of objectified ancient oak objects. Otherwise, just return the primitive as is. Um, so that's how the getters get implemented. Ancient oak has this uh, dump method, which just gives you a pojo back <coughs> of, your, of your data tree for that particular version. Length is quite nice. Ancient Oak's got this reduce function, which acts much as you'd expect. So you can't, you can't call length on an Ancient Oak object, but you can for each on it, and you can reduce it. So that's reducing all the keys it can see. Because, uh, because of the nature of arrays in JavaScript, you can kind of think of them as a, a dictionary where the keys are integers. Um, and so object at, you can see that kind of here object at is almost exactly like a get except instead of a key you call the ancient oak closure with an index and then the nicest part of the API is this patch method here so what happens is you have your ancient oak immutable data tree you call patch on it with a, a kind of subset of a tree that you want applied to your original and it will go through 
kind of merge the two trees and give you a new version back. The original is unaffected, you get a new version back. I push this new version onto this versions array. And then sadly, and this is the part that I'd love to make neater, this bit's OK. So this goes through each key in this new, this new diff for the patch and just calls a notify property change on it. So all the bindings for the rest of the app can update. And then rollback. Rollback's a bit of a shame. So my thought with rollback was, well, this, this is cool. I can just jump to any version in my versions array or I can just pop versions off or pop the number I want to off. But to get bindings working, I need to know what keys change between each version. So uh, what I resorted to just for this demo was to just say, like, before I popped it off, what were all the keys available at the top level of that tree and after, and I've just put them in a set. So I've got this uh, set of the unique keys that might have changed. Sadly, they probably won't have all changed. And then just notify all of them. So when you do a rollback, all of those observers will fire. And that's as far as I've got so far. So I, I'm going to keep pursuing this because I think, I think these things are really interesting and, and potentially very, very useful. And if, if they can be made to talk Ember's language and use, you know, give you access to Ember's normal tools in this kind of safe, efficient way, then that would be pretty cool. So that's all I've got. Any questions? It looks like you're cloning the ancient oak object when you're setting up versions? Uh, the wrapper, yeah, I kind of am. So I'm having to allocate a new ancient oak object. Ideally, I'd like to be able to... I'm not sure. So that's kind of for a subtree, okay. is the thing. It would be really nice not to have to do that. There's loads of compromises in this code. Oh, I understand. Um, so you're getting a key, and it's a subtree. So what do you do with it? The, the Maybe you could just sort of make the rest of your application aware of how to interact with ancient oak yeah. closures, but maybe which is just a wrapper. Maybe it's just the, well, the way the wrapper is. Yeah. Right? It's a bit, it's a more thought through in that way. Yeah, maybe just a way to make the wrapper allocate as little as humanly possible. Like, I, I mean, because that wrapper will then get its own versions array. It would be nicer if it was sort of aware that it was a, a subjugate of some some parent tree object, yeah. like as one root node. So Jamie, I know you've fallen in love quickly, um, and and you were in love last time when you saw this. Are you still in love? Do you think it's do you think it's a, a great idea? I and mean, do you also think it's a, a highly practical, a practical idea that you expect to use? I'm still searching for like the the really good practical demo for it. I think the API for Shimon's library is is really really delightful. It's lovely, um, but I think I can't think of an app I'm working on right now where I'd need a persistent data structure in it somewhere, but I really want to find one. Like, I think the idea is so cool that I'm willing to make trouble just to <laughs> find an excuse. <laughs> Joe, I'm wondering if perhaps there is not a specific application in terms of app, but if we can rip out the entire Ember computed property logic and replace it with immutable objects, do you think that's possible? I'm not sure. I, I had a, a bit of a deep dive into, into Ember Metal to see how these things are implemented. And actually, there are hints of persistent data structures in there. They do, there are f frozen objects get made in several different places. And I, I can't really explain it very well, just like I can't explain persistent data structures very well in terms of implementation. But I think, yeah, you could potentially create something which behaves much like bindings is the tricky part. I think you'd, maybe because Ancient Oak is such a closed system, if there were a way to hook into Ancient Oak a little bit more, then that might open up some possibilities. So I, something I might discuss with, with Shimon. Um, I saw one good use case was uh, a cave of chess, so you preserve state for every move. That's awesome, yeah. But I was wondering, is there any disadvantages to having all those copies of models in memory so, yeah, I'll just repeat. Can you persist this type of data to the server neatly? So I'll just repeat the question for the sake of the recording. Um, so the, the really good example was a game of chess and using a persistent data structure to capture each state of the board, which is a really good example. I wish I'd thought of that. Um, and the question then was, should you be wary of 
allocating so many objects? And I think the answer is that the, a persistent data structure should help you with that because you only, you're only going to allocate changes to the tree and whatever you don't change, you're always referring to the same spot in memory. You're not making a copy of the whole tree. Yeah, you, you never make a complete clone of the tree. You just make a new tree with a new root node and new branches out to your brand new values, but the old branches point to the old tree. So it, it shares as much memory as it possibly can in, in principle. In, yeah. Just the diffs. So you look for a key, pop the first one off, it's not there, goes the next one, goes the next one until you find one. Mm -hmm. That's the latest version of that property. And that immediately says, well, to roll back, you just lose that layer of stack. And it might make a patching quicker as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat some of it. There was some really good stuff in there. So what was the name of the library in C Sharp? Uh, Bold, originally. Bold, OK. It sounds a little bit like, it sounds a little bit like core data, I guess, in, in Coco on that platform. Um, yeah, this, uh, so keeping a load of diffs in a stack, that sounds like Git, which sounds like a really good idea. So um, yeah, I totally agree. I, this, was like, this was an excuse to use ancient oak more than anything else, and I, I do like it, and I think there are lots of places it could be applied, and it's lovely and lightweight. Um, but yeah, keeping a stack of diffs is definitely another approach, and I'm sure could be made to be very performant. The other option is what you're talking about is extension. Say, do a patch, but tell me what you patched. Yes, exactly. You have to query ancient oak for the data because it must know what's been patched. Yeah, patched what hasn't been patched. Yeah. And rather than trying to keep it as a layer on top of ancient oak, actually extend it. Yeah, actually, I'll just um, I'll put up the ancient oak slide again. Well, in fact, I'll tell you what, I'll bring up the, uh, the repo just to give Shimon full credit. I'll credit to you. <coughs> Actually, I think it's best explained by its own, by its APIs. <coughs> okay. Uh, and you want the perfect example we're building a content management system, and I've got a view of all the content as a grid, and I can pop up one of them where it's in. I don't want to edit the screenshot yep. while we're editing the content. Yeah. Because uh, uh, EPF, the EPF. Yeah, the Ember persistence frame. Uh, Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And then merging it back in. I haven't actually used it. But Likewise, it definitely looks interesting. Uh, European Powerlifting Federation. I've never used that. It's a great, great audience. I'm not sure if uh, we'll be able to find. You're right, it definitely does work on that basis. I think perhaps storing diffs is the way it works. Again, like Git. Any other questions? Yes. So the, the gent at the back was talking about storing data on a server, mm -hmm. um, which persists the data over a greater period of time. Yep. Is there any way that you can export your um, states from ancient oak system on a server and then bring them back into the application at a later date? Yeah, so ancient oak has, along with dump, it's got JSON. So turn, turn your a particular version of your tree into JSON and send it over the wire is what I'd imagine you'd want to do. But even over multiple versions of um, the states that you're persisting? You could persist every state, so perhaps every time you, you get a new version you send the whole lot back or send a diff back. <laughs> or you just choose your moments and say, right, here's a moment I want to commit this version or this last few versions. 
But I think having those versions in memory, or I, I don't think you'd ever want a bunch of complete clones in memory and persistent data structures like Ancient Oak protect you from that and having diffs protect you from that. Uh, so yeah, and then you get, if you've got them all there, you get to pick and choose as to what you send back. So normally you press, <coughs> you press save, that's going to persist your, whatever, you, whatever you've entered back up to your server, you'll save that version. <coughs> there you're just persisting it on the client. Mm -hmm. At some point you're going to have to sync it back up to the server. <coughs> you use the, the JSON thing, I guess the, I, I've done this before and then ended up dumping it back in the day where you, where you want to keep a history of everything that you've done over time and then allow people to roll back. So I wrote a medical app or a hospital where everything they've done, they want to be able to go back and see a history of, of all note changes and be able to go bring one back from the stack and bring it back. So this is the same, a similar idea, but you're doing it locally. You could take what you've got, persist the entire tree back up to the, back up to the API, and then use ancient, ancient oak on the server mm -hmm. to then re to reconstitute that and then save all your versions down and then save, save the tree into your data store. The magic then is working out what the data store looks like. Yeah. And then the then your trick is normally if you've got two clients and you've got you've got to have some sort of logging system of you know, who wins on that change. But if someone's adding notes, if you've got version client over here one, two, three, four, five, and client over here four, five, six, seven, eight, and then they save it, you know, your numbers are gonna get you know, how do you it's add, a leaf, yeah. the, you know, my head hurts thinking about the, the, the ramifications of that. But if you've got a, um, if someone's working on their own data, for example, then on a fairly, um, you could use uh, date and time for the, for the version numbers instead of using um, a, a simple accumulated number. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Ancient Oak on the server, it's, I mean, it's a fully node compatible library, so definitely. Anything else? Curious, how does it actually enforce the immutability of these gets and sessions? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, it's probably explained all pretty well here. So when you, you use i, uh -huh. you feed it your starting data tree and you just get a function back. Uh -huh. So it's a closure. So all the data is contained within this function. You can't get at it. And what's more, this function is frozen as well, so you can't even add extra methods to it. Um, and then you get by calling the function with a key. You set by calling set on it. Uh, I think there's an example of that. Oh, and yeah. So if you, this is the example of if you're, if you're kind of burrowing down the tree, you can just throw keys at it like that. Um, set pretty self-explanatory. But of course, when you set, you get a new. A brand new version. Oh, yeah. You don't. You don't change the original version. You get a new tree, but that shares memory with the the other version, and then yeah, all these other nice methods that you put in. And I think under the hood, this is a the implementation uh, is a is a binary tree type of a thing. Um, I've put my slides away, but yeah, it's uh, this is a clip of his slide, and it's kind of what it looks like under the hood. It's it's very optimized. <coughs> it is better examples. Shimon. Using a, using A B C and D doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> the chess game, I think, would or a CMS, but the, the chess games are nicely. <coughs> it's got rules. It's contained. Like yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Jim.